Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, what happened to the monsoon? We'll try to find out where our summer storms are hiding. Also tonight, we'll look at the upcoming national political conventions from a legal perspective, and we'll meet the city of Tempe's new arts director. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Jerry Williams, the next chief of police for the city of Phoenix, was introduced today at City Hall. Williams is currently chief of the Oxnard, California Police Department, but before that she served for many years with Phoenix PD. To the Phoenix community, wow. Uh, I stand before you today ready to take hold of this agency in October. I will listen to your concerns. I will be your representative. I will represent you. I will represent us uh, because I think that's what law enforcement is supposed to do. She is a true Phoenix street cop who rose up through the ranks and she served on almost every level that this department has to offer and she understands what our police officers on the streets encounter every single day and she knows how to keep them and our community they serve safe. It is now required for me to take the culmination of that knowledge and leadership and experience and work alongside with this community, the department, and the city to consistently demonstrate just how progressive the Phoenix Police Department has become and will be in the future. Zerker was asked about the hiring of an African-American police chief considering the increase in racial tensions between police officers and African-Americans around the country. This process started over nine months ago. It's been ongoing before a lot of this happened. It, it uh, ends today, but that is purely coincidence because it is about the qualifications of this person uh, that speak for themselves and speak loudly. Williams is Phoenix's first female police chief. She's the wife of former city councilman Cody Williams and the mother of Phoenix Sun Center, Alan Williams. First day on the job for the new chief is set for October. Well, we haven't seen uh, much of Arizona's monsoon this summer. The state is usually being peppered with dust and thunderstorms this time of year, but not so this summer. Here to help explain what's going on is ASU climatologist Randy Cervini. Welcome back. Thank you. Got some splaining to do. <laughs> I mean, what happened to the monsoon? What's going on out there? Nothing's going on. Nothing's out there. going on. Well, the problem is that our fuel line got cut. Uh, we depend for the monsoon thunderstorms on moisture. Uh, that moisture has to come up all the way from Mexico, particularly from the Gulf of California and the Pacific Ocean, and it has to come into Arizona. Well, if that gets stopped from coming up into Arizona, we can have all the other factors in place, but we're not gonna get any thunderstorms. What's stopping it? Well, the, over the last week what happened is that we had uh, actually a storm system that was over the northern part of the country that was kind of blocking all of that moisture from getting up into Arizona. It was just barely touching upon the southern parts of the state, but now that storm system has moved off into the, into the Great Plains and over into the east coast, and so over the next week, we're going to start to have that moisture surging up. You'll start to see thunderstorms in Tucson uh, over the next couple days, and then hopefully by early next week, we even should have them here in Phoenix. Holy mackerel. Okay, we'll wait for that. Uh, how unusual for so little action this time of the month of July? Well, a lot of people don't realize that July is really not known for that many storms. It, the monsoon, it consists of what we call bursts and breaks. There are periods of high activity and there are periods of low activity. Well, Actually, July tends to be a low activity month. We'll have periodic storms, and we've missed a few of those, but most of July is dry as opposed to having storms. Now, August, it kind of slips around a little bit. Okay, so but we are in a lull. Does the lull mean the storms will be a lot stronger when they come around? No, nah, not necessarily. Not necessarily. It, it just it simply means that we didn't get some moisture that we definitely could have used, but it doesn't really have any impact on what's going to happen in the future. Okay, later start for the monsoon. Does that mean a later finish? No, again, not necessarily. The trouble is that these storms are driven very much by local conditions. There's not a, a long uh, setup situation like we talk about when we talk about wintertime El Nino events and that type of thing. The summer is very much concerned with what's happening here and now and 
what happened a few weeks ago or happens in the next week really doesn't have a big impact. But on we've it. talked about high temperatures kind of suck that moisture up here. You need the high temperatures in order to get that. That's the break that we get. That's our natural break. Right. You live through the 118, 115 to get those. Stuff. Well, we had all that stuff and the storms still aren't coming. Right. Now, was again, because that storm system. But notice what's happened over the last few days. We've been back up to 110. Yes. That's charging us up again and it's starting that flow of moisture northward so that by next week we'll be back down into our normal 105, 106 degree range, but we'll have a lot more humidity and we'll have those afternoon thunderstorms. You mentioned 110, 110 or more, 18 times this year. The average for the summer is 19. Again, what's going on? Well, we're almost done with that kind of situation. If you look at the annual trend of our temperatures, right today is the first day where we've the average temperature goes down. Uh, yesterday, the average temperature for this time over the last 30 years was 107. Today, it's 106. So we are now in that downward slide, and it's going to be hard for people to realize that, but yeah. we are starting in that downward slide. So basically, if we have a few more and it gets to be 21, 22, it's a little above average, but not crazy above average. Right. And, but keep in mind, we can still get a dry slot. One of our, the second highest temperature that we've ever had in, in Phoenix actually took place on a July 28th. Oh, goodness. So that was 121 degrees. So we can get that dry conditions, but it's less likely now than, say, in late June. Okay, is there a La Nina forming right now? There is. Uh, now, what does that mean? That means dry winter, doesn't it? <laughs> well, given that I was totally wrong about <laughs> El Nino, I'm not going to necessarily say that, but traditionally, yes, El, uh, La Nina means for dry conditions. We get all the storms going up into Oregon and Washington, and we get uh, sunny skies and Chamber of Commerce weather. Does the fact that a La Nina is forming uh, impact anything at all that's happening to us now this summer? Actually, it does. The big thing that's, that's going to be happening as we get uh, La Nina going on is we're going to have a lot more hurricanes off the west coast of Mexico. And as we get into October, some of those hurricanes are actually going to drift and fall apart, and then their remnant moisture is going to come up into Arizona. So that a lot of our moisture that we get in October is actually the result of dead hurricanes that are off the coast of Mexico. And that's going to be much more likely now that we have La Nina going on. And if that's much more likely, that means uh, rain for usually the western and southwestern parts of the state, correct? Right. Yuma and, yes. and, and that area is going to be much more likely. To All get right. That. Forecast for the rest of the summer. Forecast for the rest of the year, please. Well, uh, right, I'll, I'll tell you what the Climate Prediction Center is going with. They're saying that we're going to have a near normal monsoon. So that we're going to end up with about, by the end of September, maybe two additional inches of rainfall. Uh, but the forecast for this fall and into the winter is going to be for drying conditions then. So that we m probably won't get to our normal eight inches of rainfall for this year. Really? Uh, and temperatures? Temperatures are going to be hot. I mean, that's, that's the, the traditional Western situation under La Nina. Last question. La Ninas seem like they last longer. They go on for more years than an El Nino. Is that correct? That is correct. About one out of every seven years is El Nino, but about five of those seven years are La Nina. Well, an El Nino last time might as well have been a La Nina. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there was exactly. nothing going on. All right, Randy, always good to see you. <laughs> Thanks. My pleasure. Introducing Classical Arizona PBS, your classical music connection. On TV, listen to Classical Arizona PBS on digital channel 8.4. On the go, download the free Classical Arizona PBS app to stream performances. Find out about classical concerts and watch exclusive videos. 
Download the free Classical Arizona PBS app. Then follow Classical Arizona PBS on Facebook and Twitter for news, photos, and events near you. Classical Arizona PBS, your classical music connection. The Republican National Convention is set to begin Monday in Cleveland. The Democratic Convention will be held the following week in Philadelphia. We've looked at what happens at conventions, but how much of what happens is considered legally binding. Here with the answers, constitutional scholar Robert McWhorter. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me. You betcha. Uh, so th let's start with just the actions of it at a convention. Are they legally binding? Well, there are state statutes. Uh, the Arizona statute is uh, ARS 16-243, uh, which says that a delegate to the national convention shall vote for the winner of the primary of that state. However, there's no particular sanction if they don't. It's hard to know what would happen if they decide not to. Just the statute says they shall. Yes. Okay, so I don't want to get more to that in a second right. here. But as far as convention rules themselves, let's say, oh, I don't know, the Republican convention decides to change the rules for yep. some reason. Um, legally binding? Of course. Th they can change any rule that they want. Now, there's 111 members of the Republican Rules Committee. If 56 of them vote for a conscience clause, you can vote for whoever you want, it totally changes the rules. If 56 of them says you, get a, you, you should have a different number of delegates to win the primary, I mean, Trump right now has uh, just over 1,500, 1,542. Mm -hmm. uh, the, he needed just over 1,200. If they said, no, 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 you need 2,000 to secure it, they could do it. They're a private corporation. They can do whatever they want. Now, the other number to keep in mind is, let's say they don't get 56, and the Trump forces say that they're never going to get 56. If they get 28 delegates on the Rules Committee of, of the 111 right. to, to, to write what's called a minority position or a minority report, then it goes to the entire floor where just under 2,500 delegates can now vote on this issue and decide whether they're bound by their primary results or not. And this is all allowed in their rules. And, but again, you're saying their rules. What about like the, the individual First Amendment right to do? I mean, it's, what if I'm a delegate and I'm from Arizona and Arizona went for Trump and the, the, mm -hmm. the party says you better go. You, you gotta, make, I think they make you sign a pledge. I think the Republicans yes. have to sign a pledge. But I go there. What happens to my free speech rights? What makes me not stand up and say, I don't want to do this? Okay. Your free speech rights, the First Amendment, and this is what a lot of people don't understand about the First Amendment, it only protects you from the government impinging on your First Amendment rights. These are private companies. A political party is nothing more than a private corporation. They have bylaws, they have certain rules, whatever, and they change them all the time. That doesn't mean the government can necessarily come in and impinge your rights. Right. Any person can be a jerk to another person to get them not to say something. That's not government interference. So yeah, they can say whatever they want, but they've agreed to be bound, like you join a corporation, you, you agree not to do certain things, yeah. it would normally be a free speech right, um, and they've agreed to be bound. Now, how much they can be punished for not following their agreement is an open question. Let's talk about that, because do convention rules trump, if you will, state law? It's hard to know. Probably they do. Now, let's go back to the Arizona statute, right? Yeah. 16 to 43. It says they shall. But if the convention, the national convention, says, oh, no, 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 you can do whatever you want, well, that delegate can now say, wait, I'm following the national convention rule. Aren't right. we part of the national right. convention? And the state party could say, no, no, you're part of the state rule. Well, where are they going to hash all this out? Is the state party going to sanction them? And then will the national party sanction the state party? Um, Nobody has quite worked this thing out very well. And when you talk about changing the rules, the, the, at a convention, a party can change any rule any time it wants. Right. This is not a democratic process. This is a private corporation yeah. that makes its rules. And the whole process creates delegates in a winner-takes-all system. Uh, and this is the interesting thing. If you take a look at the delegates, okay, now Arizona went for Trump. Right. So all of our 50 plus delegates are going for Trump. A lot of those delegates weren't Trump supporters in the first place. Right. Now they're bound to go for Trump and the state party is saying they have to do it, but it's a free for all. And again, though, if the rule changes contradict state law, contradict the fact that, you know, rule says now, Robert, just go vote whichever way you want. Mm -hmm. Arizona party says, 
you're, you signed a pledge and you, you are bound. You're bound. Well, well. If you're willing to take the consequences in the Arizona party, they might be annoyed at you. That could be fine. Now, there's another way that the dump Trump supporters want to want to go at this, and it's called the Bartleby, Bartleby rule. And it comes from a short story by Helm, Herman Melville sure. called Bartleby the Scrivener. Yes. I would prefer not to. And what they want to do is they want to have everybody, forget the rules committee. Let's say all the rules stay the same. They want to have everybody on the first ballot prefer not to vote, which denies Trump the 1,200 plus ballots, uh, delegates that he needs, which then puts it into a second round of voting. Now, the same state statute I just cited says that on the second round of voting, everybody's not bound. It's a free for all. It's free for all. Now, some states it has to be the third, and some states it's the fourth. Arizona says on your second time around, you can vote for whoever you want, and that is a brokered convention. Far more interesting. Oh, yeah, it should be definitely far more interesting right. as far as the TV aspect. The TV aspect. Uh, so where were the likely league? I mean, obviously, the delegates and this sort of thing that we've been right. talking about, that's, that's A1. But will there be other legal fights at this convention? At well, both conventions, uh, really. We're talking Republican, but the Democrats are going to be there, too. Yeah, but the Democrats have gotten a little boring. I yeah, mean, in terms well, of convention play. Yes. Okay, and they've all agreed on a, on a progressive platform. Everybody's, everybody's going to have. And, and what's happened... Um, is the parties have gone to non-contentious conventions because they want to show a united front. The last contentious convention for the Republicans was in 1976 when Governor, then Governor Ronald Reagan, challenged Gerald Ford. That was the only time it was in question. The last Democratic con uh, contested convention was 1980 when Senator Edward Kennedy yes. challenged Jimmy Carter. Those were the last two times anything was in doubt. They've been pageants since They've been then, pageants, they? coronations. Yes. And that's what they want them. They want to present the show. Now, well, this might not be the coronation that the Republicans normally would have wanted. Now, the Democrats look like we're going to a coronation. Yeah, it is going to be all scripted. we got about a minute left. That's okay. all we got. But is this what the Founding Fathers wanted as far as political conventions? Were they didn't even want political no. conventions. No. James Madison and Federalist Number 10, one, 10 wanted to go against factions. They didn't want parties. Now, that being said, he wrote Federalist 10, and he put the Constitution in and did all that. And then he got together with Thomas Jefferson and created the first political party. So they were pretty divided on that. Um, they used to select uh, presidential nominees by a congressional caucus committee, mm. and that fell out of repute. And by 1832, Andrew Jackson, because he was a little annoyed at what happened with the election of 1824, which we talked about one of the times I was here, created the first political convention, the Democratic Party's first political convention, and that's what happened. And it's been a lot of balloons and party hats a since then, right? Since then. Yeah, all right. Good to have you. Good information. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Take care. Tonight's edition of Arizona Art Beat looks at the city of Tempe's new arts director. He is theater veteran Ralph Remington, who joins us now on Arizona Horizon. Welcome to oh, thank you. the show. Welcome to the state. Now, have you hey. been here long? I just moved here June 1st. Are you familiar with Arizona? I have two brothers-in-law who live here, and uh, so my wife's family is here, and I've been here on and off over the years, but I've never lived here. Yeah, well, welcome yeah. to town. Welcome well, to you. summer in Arizona. Thank you, thank Welcome you. to Tempe as well. Uh, an <coughs> Arts and Culture Deputy Director. W what are we talking about yes. here? Well, actually, I have two titles. So I'm Artistic Director of Tempe Center for the Arts, as well as being Deputy Director of Arts and Culture for the City of Tempe. So that includes all the stuff that happens in the theater spaces, the gallery, the art, the art gallery in Tempe Center for the Arts, arts and culture, meaning public art, education, all of those things that are 
on our campus where the library is. Yes. So I have that as well. And it basically covers the entire city of Tempe. Now, I know that the, the goal was to advance goals in arts and culture, in sort of an arts and culture plan that Tempe has. Talk right. to us about that. Well, that's, that's what brought me here. Uh, there was an arts and culture plan that was put together by the uh, constituents of Tempe, and the citizens got together. About over 900,000 people got together to put this plan together with how they wanted to see the arts advance in the city of Tempe. And one of them was to have a definite direction with the TCA, with the Tempe Center for the Arts, and have a purposeful plan as, how, as to how we move forward. And that's a, that's a beautiful building there it's beautiful. Uh, along the lake. It's fantastic. Is it being used to the best of its capabilities? Well, I think yes and no. Uh, in the past, it's been largely a rental institution. And we have some resident groups. Child's Play is a resident group mm -hmm. there. Stray Cat is a fairly new resident group there. But it's largely been a rental institution around those, around those groups. And what we want to do now is the Tempe Center for the Arts wants to actually become a producing entity as well. So we're going to produce plays, direct our own plays, bring in national and international artists. And so we'll also be working in partnership with the resident groups. So we're going to do all of those things and everything else in multidisciplinary. So there'll be dance, there'll be visual art in the galleries. Uh, there'll be um, theater, obviously, performance art. We want to activate that lobby space, activate all the area outside of the theater uh, so that there's always something. So from the time people step onto the sidewalk to go into the theater at Tempe Center for the Arts, they're confronted with lots of stimulus. I, you mentioned bringing in national acts. Have they been reluctant? Has the city been reluctant to do that at that facility? Well, largely it hasn't really had the leadership, the purposeful leadership, uh, that we're, the direction they're taking right now. The plan dictates that direction. So prior to this, uh, they had a stable management of Tempe Center for the Arts, but they haven't had leadership to kind of move it forward and become a major player on the national scene, and that's what I'm here to do. All right, so <coughs> with that in mind, the current state of the art right. in Tempe, what, what, what is the current state of arts? Well, I think the city of Tempe um, has a, a great cultural community, uh, and the state is, I think, fairly good. You have Child's Play, who's been here for a long time, Stray Cat, uh, Arizona Theater Company, which is coming along some rough times mm -hmm. now, and um, sad to see that. But, I mean, there are a lot of independent groups, a lot of independent artists, and what we want to do is form a, be the, like the nucleus for all of those artists to gather around. So we want to present those artists, produce those artists, produce some independent things as well, and bring in some national and international acts as well. The university uh, <coughs> there, it's, it's, it's the giant in the middle of the yes, room. Yes, it is. Um, how do you work with the university? I know Colleen Jennings for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, she's at Gamage. <coughs> Excuse me, and, and we'll, we'll be working together. We'll be working together with Liz Lerman, who's a, a MacArthur fellow who's, who's coming to town, who's working at ASU now, Michael Rode who comes from Sojourn Theater, and we're, we'll be working with them, try to do some community building. We want to go out and not just have art in the space, but we want to have art in the community, so where people live. For instance, if we want to do a play about violence in the schools, we actually want to do that in a classroom to show how that plays out, and so people actually have a feeling of being in a classroom during a possible violent confrontation. So we want to do art, we want to take the mountain to the people instead of people coming to the mountain. Interesting. Uh, you come from a theater background. I do. Uh, how do you think that helps in this position? Well, I think it helps a lot. I, I, prior to this job, I was uh, director of theater and musical theater at the National Endowment for the Arts, and I was in Washington, D.C., so for four years. So I funded uh, theaters all over this country, including theaters in Arizona. And, um, and in that capacity, I saw 130 to 150 shows a year all over the United States of America. So those artists are all friends of mine. They're all associates of mine. And they all have a place to live and a place to stay now in Tempe, now that I'm here. So I want to tap on all of those relationships and bring all of those artists that Tempe hasn't been privy to in the past to the future in Tempe Center for the Arts. And you were also once a member of the Minneapolis City Council. I was. I was a Minneapolis City Council member. Uh, what was that? How was that? How was that? That was great. It was great. <laughs> uh, I've always been politically active. And uh, some, some of my friends told me to put my money where my mouth was. So I ran for office and I won. And it was great being able to not only uh, have indirect power, as the arts tend to do, but also to have direct power to help impact people's lives for the better. I was going to say, and it probably also helps you understand how things get done. It does. I know how things get done, absolutely. And so my relationships with the mayor and the city council are already off to a fast start because they know that I know how, how things work in a city. 
And uh, my boss, Shelly Hearn, who's a, a community services director, she knew that when she hired me. And so we're, we're working with the city, with the citizens, with the artists to build one big institution where everyone can feel that they have a voice. All right. Well, very, congratulations. Thank and you good so luck much. to you down there. Thank you so much. All I right. appreciate it. Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists' Roundtable. A lawsuit is filed to block a ballot measure that calls for the legalization of marijuana. And Governor Ducey endorse, endorses, I should say, Senator John McCain in the GOP primary. That and more on the next Journalists' Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. The Arts and Culture Fund is made possible by Signal Society members Eleanor Light and Judith Hards, and by You Can Become a Curator of the Arts on Arizona PBS. For more information, call 602-496-8888.